Uh, and Charles is going to do a very brief hour and a half presentation. <laughs> uh, no, Charles. So Charles is 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 filling in uh, for for uh, Gary Livecap, who unfortunately uh, could not be here. He was here for the first uh, for the presentations in the spring, uh, and Charles is going to uh, stand in for him. Uh, th thanks to all of you for staying for the last presentation, and I will reward you by being pretty quick um, in going through it and apologizing for not being Gary Leibcap. Uh Gary would, of course, give a much uh, more nuanced and wonderful presentation of his paper than I can, but I will say that um, I have seen the paper at the pre-conference and then talked to Gary at length over the phone to make sure that I am not misrepresenting too egregiously what he would say if he were here. So the first thing to notice about uh, federal land uh, is that they are vast and that they are concentrated in the West. Uh, if you, so first let's just talk about how vast. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm doing my own screen and I forgot to do this. They're vast, <laughs> and they're in the West. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How vast are they, you might ask? Well, uh, 473 million acres, 21% of the land area of the lower 48. So first thing to disabuse yourself of is that this is all about national parks or some other kind of amenity space. No, that's a very small percentage of it. That's the 27 million acres. And the theme of this paper is that federal lands likely under contribute to public welfare compared to a counterfactual that would have, um, I'll put my own gloss on it, either private ownership <clears throat> or some kind of um, public um, administration that would mimic fully uh, the incentives of private ownership. But the simplest answer, and I think Gary would say private ownership would be far superior. And what's interesting about this paper, too, from a broad theme perspective, is it fits very nicely with what we've been saying many times today, which is the theme here really is about agency. It's really about why it matters that the federal lands aren't privately owned, because Given that they're not privately owned, that means they're managed by um, a group of administrators in the bureaucracy. The point of Gary's paper is that that will deliver uh, suboptimal outcomes. And he's, so this paper is going to try to explain, first of all, why this outcome happened um, and what's the uh, logical evidence or empirical evidence for believing <clears throat> that the outcomes are likely to be suboptimal compared to a private ownership of lands. As you can see from the last part of this slide, um, these are the laws that have set up this um, administrative state of federal lands. The Multiple Use and Sustained Yield Act of 1960, the National Environmental Policy Act of 1970, the Endangered Species Act of 1973, and the Federal Land Policy and Management Act of 1976. So how are they managed? Um, in general, with no mandate for any cost-benefit analysis in deciding how particular land is going to be used. That is, there is no standard that's really being applied in any that we would recognize as an economic standard of costs and benefits or trade-offs. There are certain groups out there call them ad advocacy groups, that spend a lot of time and energy um, arguing that it's great that we're uh, maintaining the status quo of the federal lands or supportive of conservation, which is the mantra of the administration of the federal lands. Um, but there's really no transparency uh, about these decisions. That is, general ci citizens have little to no information about how particular decisions are made by the bureaucrats who govern this, what kind of calculation they're making, nor do they have any idea really how to challenge those decisions. This is, might as well be done on Mars by Martians that you're never going to meet, much less that you can have a conversation with. 
And so the paper wants to try to ask, well, how do these officials make these decisions? How did that evolve over time? Um, where is all the information? How can I access this? The answer pretty quickly is there isn't any, and you can't. Um, and in the absence of that, what do we think is probably happening? Well, I'll put my gloss on it again. Some combination of special interests um, who are lobbying and the inertia or preferences of the agents themselves, that is the bureaucrats. Um, and the, those bureaucrats have extreme power. They're not really subject to any um, contestable authority. There is no real transparency or accountability as we would um, think about it. And they tend to have very long-term, very long-term lives. These agencies um, live, of course, pretty much forever, and don't really, um, aren't really subject a lot to the pressures of particular administrations either. Is this costly? So Gary's answer is, well, we don't really know because there is no transparency and there are no. Uh, sort of projects with cost-benefit analyses for the most part. But he gives an example of a 2007 study that finds that just from the ANWR, Alaska National Wildlife Reserve, that the cost for that, this is a present value uh, cost, would be about more than $1,000 per adult citizen to develop the uh, energy resources there. And so um, given what a small piece of land that is and given that we don't have a lot of information about the others, his point is there could be a massive uh, social loss, net social loss coming from um, the, the counterfactual if we were to administer this in a more effective way or privatize it. So what's some of the evidence that things have been, uh, that we're underutilizing these resources and that things have been changing over time? Well, let's look at uh, timber. So with the rise of the conservation movement's success in being able to uh, end these administrative agencies in limiting the use, and I'll explain that evolution over time a little bit, but the recent history has been of limiting use. You can see a decline in uh, harvest of timber. You can also see declines in grazing. And you can also see failure to take advantage of mineral resources, especially uh, if you compare it to private use in oil and natural gas. So the point is, if you look at what these lands could be used for in terms of timber, uh, energy, and grazing, what you see is either a lack of any response to market incentives to make use of the lands, or an actual decline in the use all coming from what Gary describes as a kind of uh, uh, preservation impulse driven by special interests that had been promoting that, as well as the preferences and maybe the inertia of the bureaucracy itself. So the next part of the paper is going to try to actually trace this. How did this happen? And I think, obviously, we're going to start at the beginning of the country. And Gary's point is, this fact of this massive amount of non-privatized public land would have been a, a shock to the founders and certainly would have been very contrary to their intentions. And as you can see here, the Jefferson quote is maybe the, the, the most pith, the pithiest one. The earth is given as a common stock for man to labor and live on. The small land holders are the most precious part of a state. Uh, also, this William Blackstone quote's pretty good. Um, the point of it is property, if you vest property in private hands, you'll have a successful country. So the, the whole formula for uh, thinking about land ownership in the U.S. from the very beginning, in fact, you could even say from before the beginning in the sense of the colonial uh, story, going back to uh, immigrant settlers, the notion of creating private interests in land property as essential for development is a common theme throughout the founding. And of course, the founders were themselves heavy investors in land speculation. So what happened? How did this happen? Um, well, if you start with um, land transfer laws and going up through the Homestead Act and, and other such things, of course, um, all of this land in the East predominantly was transferred successfully. 
uh, what changed was that the formula of 160 acre allocation, which uh, worked well for land transfer in the Midwest and the East, simply couldn't work very well in the West. Um, this has to do with the semi-arid and rough terrain in the West and the different uses which require much larger scale to be successful. And the point is the land laws are not revised to adapt to the new necessities in the West. In fact, um, not only are they not revised, but as we talk about historically, they become spe specifically restrictive of the transfer of, of property. Why does this happen? And Gary's point is, well, it has to do with a few trends that are going on in the US. One of them is simply the rising urban share of the population with less people who have voting power, let's say, um, tied to land ownership and especially land ownership in the West. And also um, a bureaucracy in, during the progressive era that's increasingly, we could say, elite or run by professionals with scientific background who are employed by the federal government in massive numbers. So you can see federal civilian employment rising from 131,000 in 1885 to 470,000 by 1913. And these people look at themselves as scientific managers um, and that their job is to manage the land uh, properly and to retain it. They are very distrustful of markets and private property. So part of the story is that they think, he, he argues, that the people in charge believe that if they were to transfer the land, that would lead to a social loss. Why do they believe that? Because they don't think that private parties are able to manage resources as well as the government. And so we get actually not just a failure to adapt and increase the and encourage private ownership, but the repeal of the Homestead Acts and various other uh, things that are going on here. Now, this part of the story I think is particularly interesting. Gary is saying that, so how does this work politically? How do these parties manage to, in light of the fact that there are people living in the West who want to use these resources, how do they manage to actually get away with this? And the answer is, they strike a Faustian bargain. They allow the people in the West to be able to make use through these multiple use provisions of the lands, often at subsidized rates, in exchange for not complaining that the lands won't be transferred. So it's an interesting idea that initially the political bargain is to basically get the big ranchers and others, um, um, timber companies, on your side by making them uh, sort of very happy with this arrangement. But then later, as the conservationist power rises by the 1960s, these new parties, the recreationalists, environmentalists, preservationists, whatever you want to call them, actually become powerful enough with a rising urban uh, environment that what we're then seeing, especially in recent decades, is that those people who had agreed initially as part of a Faustian bargain to accept lack of transfer are now um, not sufficiently powerful enough to even preserve their rights to use. And so what you're seeing now is an increasing exclusion of parties who had initially been part of the deal but are now being excluded because they're no longer necessary to form the dominant coalition to decide the outcome. So I think that's one of the most interesting uh, aspects of this discussion, this notion of a dynamic game where a parties can participate at one stage and then be overruled later as their power changes. So again, why did the administrators have such suspicion? Um, th here's some quotes um, that where they're basically saying that looking at the past, they see that in the Midwest, there were these terrible things that happened. Um, there was an over-harvest, allegedly, of the Great Lakes timber from 1870 to 1900, and similar kinds of arguments. And so the next part of Gary's paper is to basically disabuse you of the view that there was any real uh, evidence consistent with this over-harvest theory. So in an economic argument, if the party in control 
doesn't make a good decision about managing the resource, then prices change in a particular way. So for example, if you decided to cut too much timber, that, could, um, that would cause prices to spike after you had cut the timber. But if when you cut a lot of timber, it was just because prices were going up in advance, then your cutting of the timber wouldn't lead to a subsequent price spike. So these, these graphs here are meant to illustrate that during the period of this alleged overharvest, there's no evidence consistent with this notion that there had been an irrational uh, overuse, myopic overuse of the resource. The key period here is 1870 to 1900. Look at that earlier part of the diagram. And a similar story um, for looking at um, the national market for timber um, and rates of return. So I'm not going to go into the details of, of this except to say that I think Gary is pointing out that there really was never any hard evidence in support of the idea that these private parties were incompetent to be able to manage the resource use. And so in, in the absence of a cost-benefit analysis or any kind of market uh, response analysis, what exactly are these people doing? And what they've adopted is the notion of sustainability, of keeping constancy, pre pres preserving something on a constant basis. And of course, that's not close to being obviously the uh, correct solution from an economic standpoint. It's a biological or engineering approach to thinking about land use, not an economic one. Sustained yield appeals to engineers, scientists, and others who aren't really uh, able or is natural for them to think about economic considerations that have to do with present and future trade-offs. And so his point is there could be uh, but from this preference for sustainability and preservation, there's potentially huge loss. And so what we should be doing, he's not, Gary is not arguing that there's no argument in favor of preservation in some circumstances, or that there couldn't be some externalities, but the point is that there needs to be uh, some kind of cost-benefit analysis to be able to determine um, when and where uh, there would be a legitimate argument for preservation rather than simply an automatic argument in favor of it. And the problem is there is no such analysis being done. And Gary's very suspicious that if that analysis were done, that it would tend to prove uh, um, uh, valuable. So for example, um, and I can attest to this as a Colorado resident now, that recreation in the West is possible on private land. You, there are some wonderful places to go where the people who own those canyons or vast resources have very strong incentives to make them very pleasant places to be and to preserve as need, as need be. So there shouldn't be an automatic presumption even that just from an aesthetic standpoint that to have recreational or aesthetic preservation that you need to have public ownership. Of course you don't. Okay, so coming uh, to the question, is it likely that this is going to change? Gary's pretty pessimistic. It's hard to see how uh, the current status quo is likely to change, uh, given the power of the coalition that would make most immediate benefit from um, the privatization. Now, of course, we could imagine as economists that if you privatize the land, all of a sudden there'd be a whole new coalition that would arise to take advantage of it. But people don't necessarily think of themselves as potential ranchers or potential owners of thousands of acres in the West. And um, I encourage you all to think that way, though, because if you did, maybe you'd become a powerful political constituency to try to create more rationalization of land use there. And so the problem is, um, especially given that many people sort of, whenever they hear about federal lands, they think Yosemite or Yellowstone, that um, as opposed to places that are really um, extremely valuable economically and aren't being exploited in any rational way, it's, it's very hard to imagine a, um, rapid progress toward a rationalized policy. And I will leave it there. Um, by way of background, I spent 18 years in the Justice Department defending environmental cases uh, in the West. Well, not only in the West, but a large number of them were in the West. 
uh, particularly representing the Forest Service. And I think, I guess my basic difficult, I, I agree with much, what, much of what's in the paper, but I guess my basic disagreement is the idea that the, well, let me put it this way, if it were up to the Forest Service, they would manage national forests quite differently than they are being managed now. Two of the statutes you listed as giving them discretion, the National Environmental Policy Act and the Endangered Species Act, I would say really are much more significant restrictions on their discretion. The National Pol Environmental Policy Act requires something called an environmental impact statement. As Professor McConnell, who previously was on the Tenth Circuit, can probably attest, those are that creates a, a big target for environmental groups. The environmental impact statement wasn't complete enough. It didn't analyze such and such. Usually the remedy for a violation of the act is an injunction. The Endangered Species Act is potentially even more restrictive because it actually sets substantive limits on what Forest Service can do uh, if it's undertaking an activity that may affect an endangered species or critical habitat for an endangered species. So the Forest Service really would like to sell more timber, to manage the lands quite differently, uh, particularly in areas where there's a risk of fire, which is a major issue in the West. They are significantly constrained by these laws, uh, not only because they have to comply with them, but because if they are alleged not to have complied, they often wind up in federal court. Uh, so I think the, the that doesn't, I'm not necessarily saying that the lands would be managed in the same way they would be by private landowners. That's quite clearly not true. I'm simply saying that there's a great deal, great m many more restrictions on federal management of lands than maybe this paper acknowledges. And the fault is really not entirely with uh, insensitive or uh, federal bureaucrats who have their own agendas, but the fact that they are subject to uh, environmental statutes that make it very difficult for them to manage the lands as they would prefer to do. But let me channel Gary and see if I can uh, guess what his answer would be. And others in the room can channel him too if I'm, if I'm not getting it. John it has a good chance of channeling him. Um, I think that the, your point is right. I don't think Gary would disagree. That's an outcome <laughs> though of the last 50 years. And I think his point is it, what's really interesting there is it was that progressive movement instinct where it very much was the administrative state and the bureaucrats with coming out of the progressive movement whose instinct was contrary to the market and who used their discretionary power to limit uh, the development and that saw a way to create a coalition during that transitional period with the users um, to incentivize them to accept that outcome rather than purchase, they then got us to the point where the legislative solutions, once the environmental movement and urbanization had progressed enough, gave us this sort of irreversible, it's seemingly irreversible outcome now coming from the kinds of constraints that you're talking about. So I think that would be a, maybe a fairer presentation of the history that, that Gary would say. So I, if I gave a... a a different impression than I shouldn't have. Yep. I'd like to jump in here. This is something I've given. I, I, I spend about a quarter of my time uh, right in the middle of uh, one of, uh, 70 percent of Utah is owned by the federal government. Our, uh, we spend months out of the year just north of the of the Grand Staircase Escalante Monument and and I've also saw lots of this litigation. I. I'm sorry, what is your name again? Ron Spritzer. So, uh, I mean, I think Ron is so right about this. And I do think there's been a generational shift in the Forest Service, so it's not quite the way. But until about 15 years ago, I think the forest managers really were, um, if anything, maybe too tightly uh, uh, connected with the timber industry, that they viewed the national forests as tree farms only. I think they're tree farms partly but not only um, I'm also there are a lot of details of Gary's paper that don't ring uh, at all true to me uh, it may very well be that as a kind of libertarian thought experiment that we would think that private ownership of land is better than federal ownership of land for a lot of reasons and when you compare say warehouser's management of its forest lands to the Forest Service's management there's really, Weyerhaeuser has done a 
hugely better job on almost any possible dimension, including uh, conservation. NEPA has been a terrible problem for forest management, not just because of, I mean, I just want to add a detail. This isn't to disagree, but to add a detail, which is, um, it is, it is very easy to get a preliminary injunction against a timber sale. And if the, even if the Forest Service uh, ha is having a timber sale for the purpose of, of, of thinning the forest so that the pine beetles don't get to it, which is, and they can de devastate a forest in about two or three years. It doesn't take them very long. So these are really emergency timber sales in order to s save the forest from being destroyed. And there may be 15 environmental organizations who, in, who are part of the, uh, of the uh, administrative process debating this. 14 of them may agree with the tender sale, and all it takes is one of the more extreme groups go into court, they get a preliminary injunction, and it takes years to unwind it which means that even if almost everyone is in agreement uh, that, that this needs to be done, including you know, most of the environmental organizations, uh, it's still the pine beetle's going to win uh, and the timber sale's going to lose. And it's, uh, it, it's a true disaster. So part of what I don't recognize in Gary's paper is he, this idea that the, these people are on Mars and that nobody knows what's going on is not so. They are not on Mars. They are the federal land managers are extremely vulnerable uh, to lobbying groups, to litigation. But, but, um, but, but they're not held accountable in the terms of a process of deciding that would be uh, that you would recognize as an economically rational one. I think he completely um, recognizes what you're saying, that these conservation pressures, especially recently, are binding constraints on things. I do agree with that, but lack of trans pe people, their public hearings, we know as much about what the land management agencies are doing and why as we do uh, any other uh, uh, regulatory uh, agencies. Now, I mean, we've just been talking about forests, but we also want to talk about uh, mining oil leases on BLM land is another very important story with a se separate grazing is at least part of that decline in grazing is the drought conditions of the last uh, uh, 15 to 20 years and isn't, uh, you know, isn't irrational management at all. Uh, but just one final point about this. So if, if, if in the end the, we, there's this abstract question of would private ownership or public ownership be better, I don't think that the reason we have so much public ownership was the progressives. Uh, for most of this period of time, the federal government had a land disposition uh, uh, scheme. There isn't just the Homestead Act, there's the Desert Homestead Act. There's all the, uh, the railroad building which involved giving large chunks of land to, uh, uh, to the railroads. The Mining Act of 1866 gave away lots and lots of land. Um, it wasn't, an, 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 and even then, the land that we're looking at, that huge amount of, of vast territory, is what was left over when nobody wanted most of it. And, 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 and if I were Gary, the way, what I would want him to do is to do a comparison. So, uh, uh, and there is a great comparison set here, which is the uh, trust lands given to the states. Every, uh, out of every uh, parcel, two out of the 36 squares were given to the states with the express uh, purpose of, of maximizing uh, return. So the states actually do act like capitalists with respect to their parcels, and much of that land remains in public ownership, not because they were told to, because they were trying to maximize profits, but because even somebody maximizing profits ends up not selling. So uh, I think a, a great thing for Gary to do would be to ask, well, what are the differences in land use between the land that's, uh, that's managed by the federal managers and the land that's managed, say, by the state of Utah, the SITLA, the, the State and Institutional Trust, Trust Lands Authority, uh, which has this you know, statutory mandate of maximizing profit. I'm not sure you would find that it's as different. 
other than you know a few of these federal environmental laws, I'm not sure you'd find it that different. Uh, so I talked so much more, but Charles now Charles and um, okay. and whoever the third person was, Will uh, Bode. <clears throat> my uh, my thought was similar, but different in that I think that what the paper would benefit from is a page or so on the pre-progressive uh, policies toward giving away land uh, and for free. You mentioned a whole bunch of things where they did, but uh, the one that always comes to mind just from growing up is the land uh, grant university uh, uh, giveaway that uh, occurred, I think, in the Lincoln administration. And all of the great universities uh, that are that are publicly uh, owned, well, one year after the Lincoln administration, uh, uh, the uh, um, the thing uh, uh, though that uh, strikes me about this is that uh, uh, it's very similar to there was a there's a scholar um, from back in the 80s, a British scholar named Madsen Peary, who was faced with the uh, um, you know Mrs. Thatcher trying to completely change the British system. And they came up, they were the, the people who created the policies of privatization, but they didn't approach it. We, we got a pale beer version of it here. Their idea was not to, to get a lot of money. Their idea was to get this stuff out of the, the inefficient hands of government and into the private sector, and each industry had a different approach. British Telecom was done through the listing of shares, or they, they called it the floating of shares. Uh, but um, um, if they, they could find a way, I mean, there's there are ways um, to uh, to uh, create new aspirations, programmatic aspirations that are like the land grant colleges that um, would I think be justified by not auctioning off these resources, but by uh, transferring them uh, in a good cause. If you look at today, what happens when? What are they, the phrase when when uh, federal lands and become redundant? Um, take a look at the Presidio in San Francisco, formerly a, a military base, and the politics weren't pretty, but everybody recognized this was Nancy Pelosi's particular sandbox, and uh, even the Republican administration uh, followed her lead in who to put uh, put on this thing. Private usage uh, used for the city. Usually, one of the advantages of putting it into private hands or even state hands is that from that point on, it can be sold, and you do get the efficiencies of, of uh, economic exchanges uh, as opposed to something that's locked up in, in uh, museum-like uh, like trust. So uh, that's uh, what I would suggest. It, it, the paper, I think, needs the examples of the land-grant acts and the other things all the things that we accomplished through giving away of these resources, 20, if 23 percent remains, and you, your point about the, uh, uh, the the land that was left over, um, look at what Amazon's doing today. I mean, there's a lot of land around the country that's left over that local governments have in mind to for, it would be the perfect place for Amazon's second headquarters because the project is so vast that it, it sort of changes the underlying assumptions. So there's, there's, some, there's some answers even to that. Well, uh, this, since we were talking about Tipu earlier, <clears throat> and now actually Michael's comments about Sitla, I sort of wonder about an intermediate solution that Gary doesn't pursue, which would be uh, state ownership of the vast majority of the lands, not just a couple of parcels with a sort of, with a, a specific mandate to maximize profits, but you could imagine just giving the states sort of the whole... Yeah, the whole kit and caboodle in their borders. And then, uh, I don't know, I assume Utah and Colorado would have slightly different choices about the conservation, you know, what uses to permit and how, you know, the conservation mandate. Uh, I assume some states would be, you know, would spend more time maximizing profits or working with industry and others less. But but that might be good. I mean, I, I expect you wouldn't see, it wouldn't be pandemonium. Uh, and that might be a big enough chunk to solve most of the pine beetle problem. Although maybe not entirely, because we have a few forests that run across borders. But I sort of wonder why that, whether that solution is on the table. Well, what I like about that solution myself is that you've identified a potentially powerful political constituency that could oppose the conservationists, which is <laughs> the state governments, right? So 
um, the state governments, from a fiscal standpoint, might very much like pushing for that as a national policy. So what, what I think, I think that's something that is worth thinking through as from a political economy standpoint, as well as from a sort of economic standpoint. Um, Utah is actually litigating. I think the theory is absurd, but they're litigating, saying that it's that uh, it's illegal and unconstitutional for the federal government to retain the seventy percent of the state that they're retaining. That is outside of the national parks. Right. Uh, and and just responding quickly, I can't respond because there's such all good points, and I didn't write this paper, so I don't know all <laughs> the things Gary does. But I do think it's fair that Gary's real uh, primary point is that when you don't have private ownership and you don't have a mandate to pursue a transparent cost-benefit analysis, that you're likely to have huge social waste. And then the question is how to think about how we got here, which he, I think, describes through a historical process of Faustian bargain, which is quite credible, and then also feels like we're kind of stuck because of the current political coalition. But that's what I, I like about that. So. I don't have much else to say in response to those questions. John Wallace? The end of the 20th century events are different than what happened before. And they're the result of an institutional setup that emerged around the turn of the 20th century, partly progressive, partly other things I think that Mike was talking about. There's a great book by Daniel Feller called The Public Lands and Jacksonian Politics. And if you're interested in this stuff, I encourage you to read it. Um, every single state in the West wanted all the land in their borders. <laughs> And the federal government would not give them to them because all the original 13 states own all the land within their borders. <laughs> and what they were doing is they wanted to sell that land in the West to pay off the federal debt and to make things better for them. They wanted federal taxes to be lower because they get, could get land revenues. There's something like Curtis Nettles has 121 pieces of, of land legislation between 1820 and 1841. I mean, there. This is this is the biggest issue before Congress. What should they be doing with the Western lands? And the answer is that geographically, this is an East versus West issue. It's not a North versus South issue. And the East will not concede the federal land as a revenue stream until 1841, when they pass what's called the General Preemption Act, which makes anybody can go out and claim 160 acres and pay a buck and a quarter for it. Okay, so they've given up on auctioning the land and getting the revenues out. So the states are there. They want the land. Um, and, and, and land sales continue to move so that most of the land east of the Mississippi is, you know, 99 percent of or 95 percent of it is bought up. And that all becomes in private property because of the way the Northwest ordinances are set up. When land is sold to a private individual, it becomes the property of the, becomes part of the state. When we've had lots of discussions about this uh, in April and exactly how that law, law works. And I'm trying to get in on that, um, trying to understand it better. What happens is the law never, the, no, none of us have ever been able to find something, except for the Homestead Act, that caps the amount of land you can get. So the Homestead Act is capped at 160 acres. By the time you get to the Homestead Act, you're down to, you can get 40 acres as the minimum you can purchase. Um, but the maximum is however much you want to buy. And so in 1854, they get the Graduation Act, which says that the price of land will go down from a buck and a quarter to 12 and a half cents in a series of steps if nobody buys it. So almost all that land on that map is under the Graduation Act by 1900, because it's all been public. There's territories for all that land but early on. But it's still on the 160-acre maximum. No, no, it's not. That's the homestead. Yeah. That they're, they're, so you're saying it, it, it could have been You could go out and buy 10,000 acres of land for uh, $1,200, okay? Now, why don't, so this, so Gary and I are talking about this and I'm trying, to, we're both trying to figure out the answer to this. Why don't you buy it? Well, if you can lease it for virtually nothing, you buy the land that has the water and you lease the grazing land and the timber land and you do stuff like that. So that the, the, the bargain that's made at, in the second period is we don't wanna buy this land and guess why? And I, I can't prove this yet, but I'm pretty sure it's true. If you buy the land from the federal government, the state can tax it. But if you don't buy it from the federal government, the state can't tax it. You're reinforcing the Faustian bargain, right. but giving maybe a taxation angle to right. the incentive story. That's right. So what happens then is you get a stable outcome from the 1880s, 1890s, up until the 1950s. And I think in that point, these guys really are concerned about land management. I mean, Gifford Pinchot, he's talking about maximizing the yield. Mm 
and doing this stuff. And they're professional forest managers. And they really are trying to do that. Forest Service, I think, still has. I grew up in the West and go up back out there a lot. Um, and so you set up a set of institutional arrangements in which the discretionary authority over the land remained with the federal government under the assumption that the existing users would be able to continue to use it at essentially subsidized rates. So they didn't buy it because they got a better deal if they didn't buy it. Okay. And then, you, then in the, I think in the progressive movement, there are conservation reasons for shutting down sales. And they stop you know, keeping the public domain. And then more urban voters want to have Yellowstone out there and things to go to. Uh, but that doesn't cause a problem with resources because you can still exploit it for all kinds of things until the 1960s. There's a whole series of land acts that are encouraging Here it is. people. The General Revision Act of 1891, mm -hmm. the Taylor Grazing Act of 1934. So it isn't all the 1960s and 70s. Oh, no, no, no. But those, those are the acts that are, are essentially removing sales. Yeah. Right? So they're making... The, 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 there's a Desert Lands Act. There's a whole series of acts which are attempting to encourage people to use the land, mm -hmm. right? But they're but and, and they're use not, but not purchase. Well, they're not they're not shutting off purchase yet. But I think by the time we get to Taylor Grace, they are shutting off purpose. They're saying we're going to yeah. make this land available for use, but we're not going to make it available for purchase. I think that's the general revision in 1891. But I think you've you've pinpointed where the the hazy and also Michael did where there's this hazy question of exactly what is the binding constraint on purchase from, let's say, the 1860s to the 1960s, exactly how that's shifting over time and what the incentives are that are leading to the outcome. And, so and by I, the way, I there is a difference between the Mining Act of 66 and where the, if, you, if you're mining, you actually get fee simple to the land. Yeah, you do. And so there are all these little inholdings yeah. all through the West that are where somebody mind once upon a time yeah they got a they got a section uh, or two i don't sections. really understand the economics of this it may be that it was all topsy-turvy but for grazing it is true that what I, maybe it was a faustian bargain but uh you know the idea is you build your ranch you, you might have a like a five thousand acre ranch with grazing rights over you know fifty thousand that's acres. right exactly exactly uh, and that's, that was very satisfactory. And that, that's all under the Taylor Act. And then what's happened recently is that because of the drought, they have reduced the uh, level uh, uh, of, you know, of grazing that's permitted. And people are screaming about it. Uh, but on the other hand, it's really the drought problem, I think. I don't really believe, I think the government is not really responsible People like to blame the government, but I think it's really the drought. Yeah. So under the Mining Act, the desert, you got fee simple ownership of a pe of a bigger piece of property than you would have gotten under a homestead. You could only get 160 acres, and you had to use it. If you build a mine, you get more work. If you do different things, so the, that patchwork of legislation at the end of the 19th century is sort of governing mm -hmm. the free transfer of land. But at the same time, I think there's still pretty much unlimited size. But that's a question that nobody really knows the answer to. Could you really go out and buy 10,000 acres? But I'm pretty sure you could. There's a bunch of places in Montana that are really large were bought then. Mm -hmm. Weyerhaeuser got its land somewhere. Yep. I don't know how right. what the legal arrangement was. Jennifer. It's a small point, but I was thinking the ranchers had an additional reason other than taxes to favor something that gave use and not sale when I just think about how grazing works. Because you do need, I think it's 10 acres. I know in uh, New Mexico, it used to be like 10 acres per sheep, so which is a lot of land, and that was before the drought. And you also need access. So as someone who also has a family that until very recently had a ranch, luckily no longer has a ranch, um, our ranch was actually in between the ranches and the grazing. And if you start having little bits of private prop out in the West, there's a lot of land is inaccessible except along riverbeds and other things like that. So if you started having patchwork private property in the federal lands, you could have huge patches of grazing land that was inaccessible because some guy had the only access. Cause, so I could imagine a coalition of ranchers saying, you know, there's a collective goods issue here. We have a reason to just say, let's leave it all, as long as we can use it, 
Let's leave it all in public use. Um, we have actually gone uh, into our closing remarks time, uh, Charles. So unless, are there other uh, urgent questions or comments on, on Gary Leibcap's paper? Uh, I don't have any closing remarks, oh, so have, I'm going to turn it over to Charles. He's going to be brief over the next two hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, mm -hmm. I, thank you all for coming. If you gave a paper, remember that we need a synopsis of uh, 2,000 to 2,500 words, roughly, to publish on the Hoover site. And uh, also remember, if you want to see these papers again, all you have to do is go to our website and see the videos. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you.